it's a sensitive subject to talk about the brain, and I think, in a sense, it's the elephant in the room, but I think it's an elephant that it's important to talk about. As Darren says, we know that myotonic dystrophy, although classified with the muscular dystrophies, is not just a limb muscle disorder. We're all aware it can affect heart muscle, breathing muscles, the function of the gut and the bladder. There are the endocrine pro problems with diabetes in some patients, as well as the eye manifestation. So this isn't just a muscle disease. So what about the brain? We still, I think, really don't know, but for a long time there's been suggestions that there's something about the brain, the functioning of the brain in myotonic dystrophy. And if you go back 20 years, people at that stage recognized that sometimes there were learning difficulties in children affected from birth. And there were some, I think, very unhelpful and rather non-specific remarks made about intellectual function of adults. And the sort of phrases I could glean from what was written 20 odd years ago included these sort of words, which some people, I think, might recognize, might get a feel of what people were trying to describe, but they're really, I think, very non-specific terms. They don't really help us. There was a vague recognition that not everyone with the disease was alike. Some people seemed to have more pe trouble than others. But there was this sense that there was something going on with personalities or with intellectual functioning. And I'd like really to go through why it's been particularly difficult to sort this out and to talk about some recent work which I think does help us to understand what might be going on. And the first question is, if there are differences, are these due to myotonic dystrophy affecting the brain or are they secondary to other problems? If you've got heart problems or breathing problems from your myotonic dystrophy, might not that affect how you function? Or are there other changes which can affect how all of us function? Drugs. If you're on sedating drugs, you're not going to be firing on all cylinders. That's not rocket science. Antidepressant drugs can affect intellectual functioning. All of us in this room know that if you have two nights without sleep, you're not quite yourself the third morning. So if sleep's affected, that can affect intellectual functioning. And if people get cheesed off or depressed because they've got a progressive complex disorder, all of us who get depressed, that affects intellectual functioning. So it's, the more you think about this, the muddier it gets to try and sort out what may or may not be going on. And then on top of that, how people interact with anyone with a neuromuscular problem with disability complicates this assessment. There are a number of muscle disorders, as well as myotonic dystrophy, which produce what's been called a dopey look. Now, that's not because people are dopey. It's because of weakness of the facial muscles. But people interact as if you're dopey. And then there are the age-old presumptions about people sitting in a chair or using aids, the old, does she take sugar remark. So that has influenced how people think about all disorders, including myotonic dystrophy. And if you have difficulty with speech, People get impatient, they don't listen, they think you must be stupid because your speech is affected. So all of these things have muddied the waters going back over the years. So we're already on very slippery ground. And then you've got to decide what actually you mean by brain involvement. It sort of comes off the lips very easily indeed. But again, it gets slippery when you begin to think about it. Do we mean brain structure? what it looks like, or how it works, which is more personality and intellect. They're separate things. And then you can talk about the brain structure in terms of what you can see with your eyes, and then down a microscope, and there are different, those are different components of how the brain looks. So deciding if the brain's affected in myotonic dystrophy is difficult. And all of the things I've talked about have messed up a lot of the studies that have been done before those peculiar remarks in 93, and really a lot of the studies ever since then. But I think we are a little bit further forward. There have been a lot, particularly in the last 10 years, of papers reporting scan tests on people who carry the gene for myotonic dystrophy. 
And I'll show you some pictures in a minute, but there are changes in the signal, changes in the appearance of the wires, what we call the white matter. But the wires that connect up the neurons in the brain look different. And it looks a bit more different the older you get, although we all... My brain scan isn't going to be quite the same as my brain scan when I was 20. And that's nothing to do with the amount I drink, because I don't drink too much, but... <laughs> As we all get older, things change, but the MRI scans and myotonic dystrophy do change as people get older. And they evolve with the passage of time. And there's some relationship to this mutation size. It's a very soft relationship, but there's some relationship. And there's a normal brain. I haven't got a pointer, but you can see. The two black dots at the front are the eyes. You can imagine yourself looking down on top of someone. So you can see the two big black dots are the eyes, and that thing between is the nose. There's your ear, and there's the back of the head at the bottom. And that sort of walnutty job, that's your brain. And that's a brain scan of myotonic dystrophy. And you can see a lot of the similar structures you saw in the previous one. But you can see that it's all a bit whiter here. And that's oh, cells, something we call tau. And tau is a sort of building block, and it seems to be important in the structure of these wires that connect up all the neurons. So there's a bit of a story coming out here that maybe there's something about the structure of the white matter, the structure of the wires. Tau has changed in a lot of disorders. It might be changed in a particular way in myotonic dystrophy. So we may have the beginnings of an understanding of why the scan looks funny. But this is how it appears. It's not how it works. And measuring the function of the brain has been much harder to measure and much harder to define. And, there are, and I think really how it works is more important than what a fancy picture looks like after someone stuck you in a scanner. And there was a study in, reported last back end of last year which tried to bring all this together and to take into account things like sleepiness, how weakness might affect how you can do some tasks, how the drugs, how sleep and fatigue, again, might influence intellect to try and dissect out all of these issues that I've been talking about. And they did find some difficulties with what we call executive function, planning complex tasks, the sort of things that executives do, I suppose. Some problems with maintaining concentration, what they call avoidant traits. I think all of us can recognize that if you don't want to do something. Well, try and find a reason not to. And what they call facial emotional recognition deficit, which I presume means what it says on the packet in a slightly confused way. So they were able to detect out some intellectual patterns which seem to be associated with people carrying the gene for myotonic dystrophy. But the variant, the variation they found from a normal population was a lot less striking than in a lot of the previous studies, again, going back over the last 20 years. So they could dissect these out rather than finding them being particularly striking. And rather intriguingly, they did not find a clear correlation between these intellectual changes and the MRI scan appearances. And that, I think, comes back to the point I tried to make, that how you bring looks on a scanner isn't telling you how it's working. There are some limitations in this study in that the patients who they performed these scans and intellectual tests on seem to have been relatively mildly affected. And hidden in the report on the paper is the fact that they said that the study, the tests weren't particularly difficult because they only took five hours. Well, I know how I'm functioning at the end of a three hour clinic and I'd be <coughs> mince at five hours. Anyway. They did make the comment, which has been common, I think, through all of this, that they weren't absolutely sure that the tests they performed were going to be the best tests for picking out what it was that patients and families were describing. And we still have that as a difficulty. But MRI scans do seem to show changes that seem to be relatively specific to myotonic dystrophy. The psychological tests can identify some changes from people without myotonic dystrophy. But they did make the point that a lot of the issues and the comments that go back over all the time that myotonic dystrophy has been recognized, and back to those remarks in 1993, are at least in part related to problems like sleep, the fatigue that comes with the disorder, the drugs you're on, 
the weakness that you have, and the rest of the world's perception of you. These actually seem to be at least as important. And these can be modified. We can address these. We're not yet able to do anything about anything that might be happening within the brain that we talked about on the scan. But if that's actually less important, these become much more important issues. As I say, we can do things about these. The most important is probably this combination of sleep and fatigue. Terribly difficult words to define. And how much time have I got, Darren? Because I could skip a couple if you want to get it back up to time. Uh, maybe we've got another ten minutes. Ten? Oh, brilliant. Five. Five. <laughs> Talk about... <laughs> Abnormal sleep is very, very common in myotonic dystrophy, even in people who aren't really aware of it, or in families when partners aren't really aware of it. And up to 81%, if you do sleep studies, have problems with sleep. And that affects how all of us function during the day. And we can influence patterns of sleep. There's common sense things. You can stop taking caffeine last thing at night, look at posture, Look at sleep hygiene, not dropping off in the middle of the day so you sleep better at night. And then the two, what you might call slightly more doctory medical interventions that can help sleep. The first, which some of you may have tried, I suspect not particularly gone on with, maybe, are non-invasive ventilation, these masks to wear at night so that you don't snore at night so you sleep better. But what I want to spend the last few minutes, however much Darren's giving me now and I ask, is... Three, modafinil, which I think a lot of people in the room will be aware of, some will have tried, some may be taking. And it's really to bring you up to date with some recent work that's been done by the MDSG with David Hilton Jones in Oxford, so that people are sort of hopefully reassured. Modafinil is a drug that's been along, around a long time and used for some rare neurological disorders, but it does have a history of being used to help daytime alertness in people with myotonic dystrophy. And going back a few years, a thing called a Cochrane Review, which is when a bunch of people get into a room with everything that's been written about something and work out what you can be sure about, did find limited evidence for short-term benefit in myotonic dystrophy from modafinil. So it wakes you up, but it was a short-term study, and that was all they felt they could be really sure about. Difficulty demonstrating long-term benefit. And then, last year or the year before, someone will tell me, I'm sure, the European's medical agency pronounced that modafinil needed to be used with caution. And you probably should stop giving it. But they didn't think about myotonic dystrophy as a group of patients. And there was anxiety that the drug might be withdrawn or that people couldn't give it anymore, even though there was a perception that it quite often helped in myotonic dystrophy. So, Margaret Bowler, David Hilton Jones, colleague of mine in Oxford, decided to ask those people who were actually on the drug whether it worked or not. And what I'm about to describe is in press at the moment, I don't think it's yet appeared in neuromuscular disorders, but hopefully will get pub well, will, will be published and will help to ensure, I think, that modafinil remains available to those in the audience who've got benefit from it. So, letters were sent out to 1,736. Whoever sent all those letters out is probably in the audience, so if the number's wrong, do let me know. 291 responses from both patients, relatives, and carers. And of 145 who tried modafinil, 118 remained on it, and 97% reported marked or dramatic benefit. Some had stopped the drug because it didn't work or of side effects. Some talked about headache or it woke them up too much, they couldn't actually get off to sleep. But the real point of this was the number of people who felt that there was marked or dramatic benefit. Relatives, carers, 85% of people who were on it felt that it had that level of benefit. And that, I think, has been accepted for publication because it's rather a striking set of numbers, given that the Cochrane Review and people in the past, when they did this scientifically, had difficulty in proving that it worked. There are wee problems with it that people criticise that we, 
1,736 were sent, there were an awful lot of non-responders. So what about them? Maybe they had a different experience. We don't know. We don't really know quite how the, work, the drug works, but it seems to work. There is a slight anxiety that the drug had only been given to people that doctors thought it would work for, and that's why we got a positive result. But I don't know who to give it to, and I'm not sure that anyone does yet. But, so that it seems to work, and hopefully this will ensure that the drug remains available.